only local radio talk show offering you the chance to ask your questions and express your opinions. From around your block to around the world, The Art Lewis Show is on 100.5 and 790 WSGW and online WSGW.com. The Art Lewis Show is presented by Westside Decorating Center. Hour two of The Art Lewis Show, Friday morning edition. And again, Art is off, and he returns Monday, first Monday of the new year, and Art will be along on WSGW. In the meantime, Charlie Rood here sitting in for Art. We appreciate Bill Hobson's help the past couple of days. We appreciate, in the first hour, our good friend Mike Avery for being our guest for the hour. And speaking of good friends, we have another one to welcome into the studio today and spending an hour with us, a uh, former colleague. I don't know our colleagues ever former. Uh, A good friend who is... Uh, made his rounds in the media industry, the educational uh, industry regarding media. And these days, plies his trade as the owner of a store in Midland, Radio Wasteland Records. And we say good morning and thank you for coming into studio with us, Jim Gleason. Good morning, Charlie. Thank you so much for inviting me in. Uh, It's great to be here. It's great to be back behind a microphone again. I can't tell you how much I miss doing stuff like this, but it's always fun to Sit and chat with folks, too. You were behind microphones, cameras for many years. For many years, yep. And you mentioned Mike, and it was good to hear him talking. I worked with Mike for many, many years. And little known fact, I think I'm one of the only a small amount of people who actually got to sit in as a uh, a, a guest host on Mike's radio show. And this is really in his little studio back there. Uh, I've done it. Uh, I've known Mike for a long time. And there's been a couple of times that I got to do his radio show where he wasn't able to uh, get that recorded or back even when he did it live, if I remember right. The only person that he would trust would be uh, probably you. There's a couple there, but uh, it's good to <laughs> good to see him having fun, you know, fun with this too. But uh, yeah, I, I did. Uh, you you called it making the rounds, of the media, and that is really kind of the way to do it. You know, I've done my share of radio, I've done some television, and then prior to the record store, it was just kicking in with. Uh, educational side of things so it's uh, and how many how many years were you doing that you were over at delta uh i was there for 16 some years that many okay. teaching there but uh you know started uh geez 85 doing radio up uh, up in the up and uh by 91 or 90 yeah 91 ish i was into television at that point in time and as much as you did all that it leads you to where we are today i mentioned your Ownership of Radio Wasteland Records in Midland. Yep. When did that start, and how did that start? We need to get a little listener perspective so well, we know what's going on here in our conversation uh, with Jim Gleason. Perspective kind of comes about as many of these things do with life changes. Uh, the end of 2016 and going into 2017, I was out of the higher ed thing and trying to figure out what next to do. You have 50-something dude who has got a very limited skill set with cameras and microphones and electronics. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've always been a record collector, and this goes back into the, the late 70s, early 80s as well, and have had varying sizes of record collections. And at this point in um, the end of 2016, I said, well, yeah, there's this little thing called the Internet, and folks are selling some stuff here and there. And I found a, a website called Discogs, which we use religiously as our inventory site as well, um, and I started selling some records through there. And my family, very, very supportive in this, said, hey, why don't you just open a record store? And the first thought to my mind is like, yeah, right. I've never been a business owner in my entire life. But after we did some research, my wife, Kim, very diligent on that and uh, came up with a business plan. There had not been a working traditional record store in Midland in several years. The one previous to us was one called The Turntable, which was a staple in the city of Midland for many, many years. Um, but this area being served by a couple of other great record stores, you've got Electric Kish in Bay City and Records and Tapes Galore in Saginaw. We thought, well, you know what? Midland really could use one. So we did our research. We did, uh, And within the span of really about, it, it feels like a couple of weeks, but it was around about a month or so, we went from, hey, let's do this to finding a place. And we opened our doors. For the very first time on January 13th, it was a Friday the 13th of uh, 2017. We're coming up on our six-year anniversary, which, by the way, is another Friday the 13th in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, con- congratulations. And where specifically, when we say in Midland, where specifically? We're, uh, we're kind of, we, I, I bill us as a friendly neighborhood record store. So we're a little bit north of the downtown. 
um, kind of in what they refer to as the central city. So it's uh, we're about four or five blocks north of downtown near Dow Diamond, um, but not quite to the circle, kind of that in-between place uh, uh, akin to where Ashman and Live Oak Coffee and all there is, uh, but Cahoon's Elevator. So we're in this little cluster, but really in the neighborhood. So we're at 716 George Street. Uh, when I tell folks how to find us, I said just look for the school bus garage and the uh, the school bus yard, and we're right there with that. So, If I were to say, so describe radio wasteland records if i'm walking in the door what am i experiencing when we started this i had one goal in mind i mentioned that i had been a record collector for a long time and i cut my teeth on very cool record stores i grew up in the uh, mid michigan area down in livingston county so we were about the halfway point between lansing and detroit so as a late teenager high schooler i would spend my time up in east lansing at a store called flat black and circular great, great store, or equidistant to the Ann Arbor area was another one called Wazoo. And to me, these were kind of always the epitome of record stores. You go in, there's records everywhere, there's posters all over the wall. So we wanted to kind of create that. Um, you know, I grew up in these kind of record stores, and that's what we wanted is to have that kind of an atmosphere in our record store. So we've got posters all over the wall. I've got vinyl organized here and there and everything. But it is a record store. You know, we get the new releases that come in. We've got just scads and scads of uh, vintage vinyl and old releases separated up by genre, everything from classical to country to opera. I've got a little clutch of Shakespeare records in there to rock and roll to soundtracks, you name it, jazz and blues and everything. So I, I really kind of think that, um, you know, we, we're not a huge record store by any means. If you compare it to some of the larger ones that uh, that folks have known, uh, you get Amoeba in L.A. or some of these mega stores or even chains that they're. We have a lot of records, but we just have a lot of little batches of lots of records representing all genres. And, but of course, what you offer, obviously, for Midland or those who from outside Midland can visit you. Yep. That local representation, that local connection. And you offer that uh, that local opportunity for people to visit you and be able to talk directly about their experiences and sometimes even share their experiences with material they bring to you. Exactly. The whole idea of vinyl, and I'm I'm not one of, uh, uh, not the type of person who likes the term vinyl resurgence because there are some of us who it's never really gone away from. But it's amazing to hear the stories of people coming in, whether they be retirees or high schoolers and really everybody in between, stating that, uh, you know, music is a big part of their life. Not just vinyl, but music is a big part of their lives. They can remember where they were when they heard this song. They can remember where they were when they first listened to this record or when they first bought this particular record. And with the changing of formats over the years, and we can probably get into this a little bit, with the decline, not the downfall, the decline of vinyl in the late 80s and throughout the 90s, I don't go a week without hearing somebody say, as they come in and say, man, I got rid of all of my records when CDs came out. Uh, I, I really regret doing that. And so you've got people that are trying to rebuild their collections because they have so many fantastic memories associated with that particular record or this artist, and they want to bring that back into their lives again. And a lot of times it's not going back to that era that you're talking about. And I'm not a, a music expert by any means, but I do understand and appreciate that it wasn't a lot of times the music, those album covers <laughs> were legendary. They were, and uh, some infamous and some <laughs> yeah. famous otherwise, uh, but always interesting. And there was something about holding that album in your hand that CDs and uh, most certainly digital files could never replace. CDs were cool, and they tried. Uh, man, they tried. I remember when CDs first came out. And you would get something like, let's take the Beatles' White Album, for example, a very infamous cover, but what is it? It's just a white cover. But inside of that, the original album had four individual pictures, so eight by ten, I think there were no, five by sevens of each of the Beatles. There was a giant poster inside of it. There was extensive liner notes. The inner sleeves had all the lyrics and stuff on there as well. So you get this whole package of a very cool album cover that comes with all of this cool stuff, which as a fan, you could, have, you could have, you could hold, you could put up on your walls, do whatever. And bless their hearts, CDs tried to replicate that, but you're looking at something that's a 4x4 four four square of cheap paper. It just wasn't the same. No, and you didn't want to have to pull out whatever material it was, unfold it, 
Yes, and then try to get <laughs> yeah. it back in there as well. Jim Gleason is our guest. He's the owner of Radio Wasteland Records, and he is in studio. If you have any record questions, memories you'd like to share, Jim's here, and we'd like to have your calls coming in at 989 Seven five two six one one one. A lot of fun ways that we're going to take this conversation, which we will do when we continue next on WSW. It's ten twenty one. Thanks for being with the Art Lewis Show. Charlie in for Art this morning, and a special thanks to our special guest, Radio Wasteland Records. This is business in Midland. Jim Gleason, the owner, the operator, and we appreciate him coming into studio. And again, if you'd like to post a record type question, you can do so with Jim at nine eight nine seven five two six one one one. Uh, truth be told, uh, Jim and I made a connection uh, this past holiday season yep. uh, via Facebook when you sent me a message that fascinated me because we just talked about people who might bring you material. Somebody brought into your store an old WSW Christmas album from yep. 1976. <laughs> that that must have been very unexpected. It was, but uh, not outside of the realm of possibility. I get a lot of interesting vinyl coming into the store. People who are coming into trade or sell collections or even smaller clutches of uh, records. Amazing some of the things that I find. And we have a, uh, a curated shelf in our store that's devoted specifically to Made in Michigan records. And some of these go back, I mean, years. I've got a, uh, a piece of vinyl from a, it's the audio of a, I don't want to call it a play-by-play, but essentially a description of a Rose Bowl parade from the 1960s. And I've got another one that is the audio. It's a piece of vinyl, but it's the audio for a film strip for the Michigan dairy industry to present to school children. So anything that could be recorded back then, if you think about it, though, in the days prior to cassettes being very, um, very prolific about there, the main way for audio to be served for lots of folks from the 60s and 70s was on a piece of vinyl. Um, old radio commercials. I've got one from, there is a, uh, an old business out of Marquette. You know, I spent uh, you know, a decade plus in the Upper Peninsula. Um, but there was a, a, a bakery up there called Bunny Bread. And I think that they may have had some regional um, impact as well. But they had served up commercials to radio stations on a 12-inch piece of vinyl in the 1950s. And I've got one of those in my personal collection that is a series of jingles and radio commercials for Bunny Bread. But uh, it's 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 interesting, though, that, yeah, the SGW one was unexpected, but still I thought, hey, this is cool. This thing exists. And uh, it, it was kind of a generic little thing. I heard you guys talking about that yeah. as well. It's but, that it, was, it was not like it was us doing it. It was yeah. produced, but radio stations picked up on it and made it their own. Yeah, Art wasn't singing on that no, at all. Was no, no. So. But it, that was, now there you go. You're talking about album covers. Yeah. The, the cover itself was nothing special. It had our call letters on it. But the back had Fred Krell with Listen to the Mrs. Recipes on it. Yep. That's what made it special. And you know, it, that could be the, the localization of something like this. And that made it a really cool thing for people to have. And I don't know how many were pressed. I don't know how many the station ordered at that time. I've never seen another one. Uh, the one that we had in the store, somebody specifically asked for it. So that's already gone and out the door of the <laughs> store. So it was somebody that, uh, that knew Sue or knows Sue and wanted to uh, have that in their album collection. So... We're using the word vinyl records, yep. and you, you, your perspective is vinyl never went away. It might have had uh, a downturn, but there has been a research. Why? And this has been going on for several years, but now sometimes you have vinyl that's outselling some of the digital components. It's a very interesting trend. I was working radio in the Upper Peninsula at the onset of compact discs. In fact, the the college station at Northern um, that I'd, I'd run for a couple of years and worked there for several was uh, we build this we were the first station in the up to have compact discs to be used on air granted we only had two or three of them you'd get to hear pink floyd a lot but um you know and i come from the era where i actually spun vinyl on the radio and so this move to compact discs for radio was something that was very interesting it was kind of the the beginning of that digital age where we are now where everything is literally a digital file away and a button on there but um the the notion of the decline of vinyl really was brought on by the ease of use of compact discs. And this really began in the mid-80s, 85-ish, 84, 85. But 
Um, by the time we get to 1989, 1990, you've got uh, compact discs absolutely outselling vinyl. And from a collectability standpoint, we can come back to the collectability of other records in a bit, but for records that were made in the late 80s and especially into the 90s, those tend to be tremendously valuable because there were so few of them pressed. And if you think about some of the bands that were really coming up at that point in time, you know, like Soundgarden or Nirvana, some of these late 80s, early 90s bands, if you find their stuff on vinyl, first pressing, it's amazingly expensive. We're talking triple digits, healthy triple digits on some of them, depending upon what they are and depending upon their condition. But vinyl never really did go away. There's always been a smaller amount being pressed. Uh, pressing plants in the 80s and 90s started going uh, away. Um, there's a great documentary that uh, made the rounds a year or two ago, actually in, in 2020, called Vinyl Nation. If you have a chance to find that online, it's a great, great recap of where vinyl came from, what happened to it. Uh, they tour kind of this old pressing plant that was just abandoned and somebody bought at the head end of the, and I'll use the resurgence word right there, but at the head end of this, and now it's working. So now we've come back to the point where the vinyl industry is having difficulty keeping up with demand. So the pressing plants, um, at the height of the pandemic especially, um, pressing plants were not able to keep up with the demand of vinyl, and so releases were getting pushed back. Uh, there were delays in production for several bands. If you were a smaller band, you had to take a back seat to somebody like Taylor Swift because she's pressing a gajillion copies of whatever vinyl she's putting out. So the pressing plants really had trouble keeping up with this. So, But to get back to you, I'm talking too much here, but no, to get no, back to your original it's, it's question. It's a fascinating what, way that this has yeah, all developed. What really caused this bump in vinyl coming back was an organization called Record Store Day. In 2007, uh, really kind of at the lower point of uh, the vinyl industry, there was a group of artists and record lovers and record store owners who got together and said, we really need to do something to pump up the enthusiasm. And so this event called Record Store Day was created. The first one of these was in 2008. Uh, typically, it's the third week in April uh, where they have the main one of these. So what Record Store Day became in, in the years since is a celebration of independent record stores. And it's gone from having a few dozen releases in the first two years specifically created by you know, from artists and pressed for independent record stores to several hundred releases per record store day um, being released specifically for independent record stores. And a lot of these become tremendously collectible. You go anywhere from, say, five to 600 copies for the entire country pressed, and then the record stores have to cross their fingers that they get at least one to tens of thousands pressed, so something like the Foo Fighters uh, this past uh, Black Friday record store day. So record store day as an event, as an entity, has really been the driving force to put vinyl back on the map, as it were, and really take away a little bit from CDs. I know CDs are trying to come back a little bit right now. It's, it's, it's odd to say, but you know we are, now there's an entire generation of human beings out there who were born after compact discs lost out to digital. Uh, the iPod and iTunes, I think, first came out, oh, geez, in 1991-ish, I think, in 1990 or somewhere. I'll trust, in there. I'll trust your timeline. Yeah, somewhere in there. So you've got, you've got uh, people in their 20s who have always had digital music at their fingertips. And so CDs are kind of facing what vinyl did all those years ago. And I'm not sad about that, mind you, <laughs> because I've always been a vinyl guy. But it's it's kind of an interesting take on where that's gone. And you mentioned that vinyl outselling um, uh, streaming. I think streaming and vinyl, uh, the, the news stories that pop up every once in a while say that both vinyl and streaming are the only two mediums that see growth in the industry right now. The sales growth in both vinyl and streaming are increasing while you get the likes of the purchased purchased digital music like an iTunes download or something like that and compact discs are either holding steady or in the slight decline area. So and you referenced the word collectability a couple of times. Yep. So what is the driving force right now? Is it people who want this new music that's coming out so they can listen to the vinyl or is it that they want uh, memories of what they have to collect and do nothing more than keep it in pristine condition and well I've always been of the opinion that vinyl is meant to be enjoyed. So, I mean, if you're in it for the collectability 
and the listening, I think you're getting the best of both, wor- both worlds at that point. But I do know people that collect vinyl and say this is an investment and I'm never going to. But it's anything that you could get, you could say that with. Any kind of antique or any other, you know, Beanie Babies, for example. How far did that get, folks? So, <laughs> but uh, it's meant to be enjoyed. It's meant to be listened to. And there's no reason that a record cannot be enjoyed and still be collectible. And before we go to break, I'll ask this question. And I know, obviously, it's available because people are, are listening. But one of the questions when vinyl was having that, we'll use the word resurgence. Yep. How are people going to listen to it? Who's manufacturing the record players? Who's Where are those turntables? <laughs> good things. Uh, the good thing about that is, is that a lot of the older vintage turntables, uh, especially things like a, a Techniques. I've got an old Techniques SL 1200. Oh, those are. Mm. That is the workhorse of radio stations. Yeah. And I've got an old radio station model that is 30 plus years old. That thing is a boat anchor and it will work long past I am able to. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, as long as you take care of it, vintage equipment. And to some, that still sounds the best, is if you're able to find the vintage. But there's always been some manufacturers out there that have been creating higher-end turntables. So those didn't go away as well. They just weren't being produced in the numbers that they were at the height of vinyl in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. But now we're coming back around where you're getting all of these other turntable manufacturers coming into the market as well. Everything from super high-end ones that are in the thousands of dollars, like a um, I mean, Fluence puts out some nice ones too. Uh, Audio Technica is still uh, Audio Technica is one of the bigger ones right now. They're making the ones that we sell that are good starter to mid range turntables. And Techniques still does make that SL twelve hundred model as well, but that's up in the thousands of dollars as well. But uh, everything down to there's some very very cheaper models out there that they sell at the big box stores. You know the suitcase models like we had. I oh got started on a yes, suitcase yes. model. With the speaker built right in. Carry the record player with with you and play it wherever you were. Yeah, and I'm not opposed to those because that gets people into the idea of listening to records. I just think that once you get past that notion, you get to step up into something that's going to give you a lot more enjoyment out of it. Jim Gleason is the owner and the expert, obviously, (laughs) when it comes to all things with with the record industry and his, his store, Radio Wasteland Records in Midland. We'll continue our conversation coming up on WSGW next. An Art Lewis Friday show on WSGW, Charlie Rude for Art Lewis. Thank you for joining on WSGW, the last Art Lewis show of 2022, as a matter of fact. 2023 arrives this weekend, and on Monday, Art's first show, he's back for that show. January 2nd, 2023. Jim Gleason, owner of Radio Raceland Records, in studio with us. Uh, Again, a person who's been in media for many years, some educational work at Delta College. And uh, now owner of Radio Wasteland Records, which, by the way, you have a very impressive online site. We should tell people that uh, you're accessible, RadioWastelandRecords.com. Correct. We just launched that up about a month or so ago. Well, that's um, cool. Hooked up with a, a company that does record store websites. And so it uh, really kind of concentrates on the music and what folks can see and order and the upcoming releases and all those things, too. But we do... A lot of other online. I'm, I pride myself on being Facebook on Facebook because I'm old. <laughs> I try to do Instagram, uh, a little bit of Twitter. I will not do TikTok because nobody wants to see me dance. But <laughs> you know, and the other big thing that we're pushing a lot is our YouTube channel. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a video guy as well, and so I've taken a lot of those skills to put them into what uh, we put out on our our YouTube channel. The WSGW album was one instance of that. One of my passions is to. All of these Michigan records that we have coming in, I want to be sure that they're preserved somewhere so everyone can enjoy them. That's why I I tend to put a lot of them on our uh, channel. If you're there and you you find the Made in Michigan playlist, you'll see a lot of these. And I've got a lot more yet to come. But um, just these very unique recordings that were done by Michigan artists, for example, that I wanted to make sure were preserved and out there for everybody to enjoy who may or may not be able to get a hold of a copy of that. But, uh, you know, everywhere from, like I said, our website to the Facebook, uh, a little bit of Twitter, a little bit of Instagram, but the YouTube channel as well, I try to be out there. Radio Wasteland Records, that's the name to search for. Uh, You started, again, you said uh, 2017. Correct. Okay. So you you started, you know, you get this business uh, that's, uh, hey, all right, let's get things going here. And then like every other business, just a couple years after that, boom. Yep. Pandemic. And what happens with Radio Wasteland Records? It had to be crushing. 
It was at first because the uncertainty of everything that happened in um, mid-2020, just everybody was feeling that. Um, again, I've never been a business owner, so I didn't have a whole lot of years to compare to being open only for a few years prior to that. Um, but, you know, after we took the timeouts and did the closures and everything, we began to see a very interesting trend, at least from our standpoint. I've talked to a couple of other friends of mine who are record store owners, and we've kind of felt the same way. When the pandemic at its height in mid-2020 through well, mid well the end of 20, before things began to start getting back to normal, um, people could not go to bars. People could not go to concerts. They were essentially in their homes. And if you are a music lover or a vinyl lover in this case, you've got a finite amount of, of vinyl uh, record albums to choose from. What do you want to do? People still wanted music in their lives at this time, probably more than anything because of the uncertainty of everything going on. There's some level of comfort to having an old album. Uh, we actually did okay through there because people were coming to us, especially when we were able to open our doors back up, to say, I want this. And so while I know a lot of other businesses, restaurants especially, were struggling, we were in a position to help give people this entertainment and in some cases comfort that they needed at this time of uh, their lives when everything was kind of haywire. Well, especially, I mean, music makes such a connection for people in so many different ways. It did, and so we, yeah, there was people buying records like crazy through that time when we could get them out to them. We did curbside pickup, we did appointments, we did all the stuff we were supposed to do, but even through that, there was still a lot of records going out the door. If I would say to you, Jim, who are you serving? Who, who's coming into your store? I'm, cause I'm picturing this. I'm thinking it has to be people who remember the records. I mean, and an older generation. But yet we know that there's a younger generation that's being introduced because of, well, you mentioned Taylor Swift. Yeah. And she might even be of a different generation now for some people. But is it a generational thing? And how are you reaching that younger generation? It is a multi-generational thing. I cannot uh, put one demographic on this. I've got everything from... You know, 90-year-old retirees coming in uh, looking for jazz records to high school kids coming in looking for new stuff, but also really kind of experimenting. And that's always, when I was younger, and I mentioned going to the record stores in Lansing and Ann Arbor, that's how you discovered ours. There was no internet. There was no YouTube that you could, I'm sounding like an old fart right here, but you learned about new artists from talking with your friends and seeing these artists in the record stores you know, spending eight bucks a record to take it home and try it out. And if it didn't work, you gave it to a friend and tried something else. That is what I'm seeing with a lot of the younger people coming in today, too, is that, you know, they've never heard, in some cases, and not everybody, but there are some, they've never heard of Led Zeppelin. They've never heard of Pink Floyd. Um, some, well, I've heard of Rush. You know, I remember my grandpa talking about these guys. What album should I start with? And so that level of learning is coming back in with the younger generation and it's not always younger, too. I mean, I mentioned that there's an entire generation of people who have only had digital. There are folks that are in their 20s and 30s that have never had a record player before that are getting into it and, and beginning to enjoy this now for what it is. And it's great to see. But everything from older to younger to men to women, it doesn't matter. We're getting everybody in, and it's great to see that level of interest in uh, record albums again. And. Should I ask, or can I ask, like, what kind of questions are, are you getting? Are you getting those questions about the new artists, the old artists, or, or uh, how do I start a collection, or is this collectible, people bringing you material? You must be getting all of that. We do get all of that, and, you know, we do our best to kind of, I'm pretty much a one-person operation most of the time, <laughs> so, um, but we try to help everybody out with this, and yes, there's a lot of things. Uh, how do I start this collection to, okay, I'm getting this, this is my first, uh, my first turntable, my first few records. How do I store them? How do I clean them? And, you know, we're always trying to give that advice out to folks because there is a little bit of work that goes into maintaining a collection so it lasts. I mean, there are records out there um, 50, 60 years old that will still sound great if they're taken care of. There's others that won't if they're not. Uh, I think I was looking earlier. The One of the oldest uh, pieces in my collection is from 1906. It's a 10-inch shellac, an old Edison single-sided one. But it still plays if you have the proper equipment. So taking care of these will last for a very long time, and that's what folks are learning about. But as far as discovering artists, you know, we do our best to help out with that. Um, when people bring things in, one of the biggest misconceptions that we get a lot of is because of, and I'll use my air quotes that can't be seen on radio, the resurgence, people automatically assume because it's a record album, it's worth a lot of money. 
And that's not always the case. One of the biggest ones we get is the folks coming in with Elvis records. Well, Elvis was so popular that this has got to be worth a lot of money. And the simple answer is not really. Uh, There are one or two Elvis records out there that are worth a lot of money. But they put out so many of them that there's just so many of them out there that they're not. There's not a tremendous amount of demand, and there's just so many. Uh, Great case in point, uh, brought in a collection a couple of months ago and was getting around to cataloging it the other night. That's part of what we do is we identify specific releases. Um, I cataloged from one collection 85 different albums from Elvis Presley. And for those that follow our store, these will be going out in the next week or so. But that should show you, too, there's 85 individual different releases from one artist in one collection. Somebody put a lot of work into that, but it doesn't mean that it's worth a ton of money. There are some that are, though. Don't get me wrong. You are, we're talking vinyl. Yep. But there still is the digital content, and you deal in that world. There's a, is there a, a delicate balance, a fine line that you going back and forth, or how you deal with what you uh, produce and promote it's, using social media? It's a balance, but I think that it's a, it's a relationship that's complementary. Um, digital music, you take something like a Spotify uh, where folks, and I, I don't have a Spotify account. Actually, I do. I just never use it. Um, but I, I'm old-fashioned enough that I actually have files on my several thousand songs on my phone uh, to plug it and play when I could just as easily have a playlist on Spotify and switch that out. But it's a, it, to me, it's a symbiotic relationship. Folks can use the digitals to help discover. You know, rather than uh, spend now the, you know, I mentioned 8 $9 an album in the 80s when I was buying them first, to the average price now is between $30, 25 to $30, $40 for double albums. It's a lot more expensive to get into this. So if you can utilize the streamer to say, I like this music, I like this music enough to purchase and make an investment in vinyl, that's the kind of relationship I see with that. Now, as far as what we do is putting this stuff out digitally, uh, with the older Michigan stuff, uh, for example, there's just so few of them to go around that I want as I mentioned, to have them out there for others to enjoy. Someone can still own the piece of vinyl, but if it's on YouTube, for example, on our channel, then other people can listen to it. It's a great way to preserve, too. Yes. We've got to take a break. Come back on WSDW. It's 1052. Ten fifty four. a few minutes left to talk with Jim Gleason. A good friend, colleague, and owner of Radio Wasteland Records in Midland. You're just hearing an announcement for Larry Rodarte's the Henty on Air show. Yep. Jim Gleason, any reference to a couple of guests? <laughs> <laughs> Carlos Santana, yep. Bobby Balderrama. My guess is there are some great names that would have an attachment to vinyl. Indeed. In their uh, careers. You know, Bobby is uh, he's such a great individual, and he is somebody who has enjoyed... I mean, success in a couple of different formats, obviously with Question Mark and the Mysterians, but now very recently with a number one smooth jazz song that's uh, been climbing the charts for his uh, his new work. That's so, uh, great that, stuff. That, that, that was fun to hear. Uh, we had a caller that uh, Off Air was asking a question uh, about utilizing you for, I believe it was preservation. Yeah, that's an interesting take on there. Obviously, we work within the confines of the copyright restrictions, especially with YouTube. Um, I've been asked before if people say, okay, can you just dub these over to a digital vinyl or CD? And the answer is no. You can do it. I cannot. But preservation-wise, um, you know, there's we could do stuff like that. If it's important enough and uh, we can get that out there, it's Michigan-related especially, we would be more than happy to help out with something like that. But as far as, you know, like personal, when people say, oh, can you transfer this, dub this over for me? No. <laughs> uh, we should ask... Uh People we've referenced where you are, but uh, your, your hours, days of the week? Uh... We are open uh, five days a week on Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, normally, obviously, we're going to wrap up the new year here with some holiday hours. But Mondays and Tuesdays were closed. But uh, Wednesday through Saturday, we're open from 11 a.m. until 6 p.m. And then Sundays from noon to 5. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of social media content and uh, a lot of that is accessible through your website, RadioWastelandRecords.com. In fact, I see that you have your YouTube channel prominent to there to, to, yep. <laughs> to click on. So if I were to say to you, Jim Gleason, so what is the the big stuff 
uh, on vinyl these days. Is there is there any one, two? I think I think it really depends. You know, I mentioned the other record stores in our area. Folks uh, over in Bay City know the Electric Kish. Uh, they're very very good at independent indie stuff, indie music and the like. They have a wide range of everything, but uh, they're kind of there. Uh, down in Saginaw, you've got a new record store called Audio Gazing that uh, specializes in nothing but new vinyl. And then you've got Records and Tapes Galore that has been a staple on Court Street since the 1970s that has a little bit of everything as well. And then over in Midland, you've got us at Radio Wasteland. Um, we tend to do a lot with classic rock, um, some jazz. We've got some jazz aficionados that come in there as well, a little bit of classical. But our big ones are usually 80s hair band, metal, or straight up classic rock like Zeppelin and Floyd and things of that nature. If I were to ask, what is on your playlist? Ah, now my playlist is interesting. <laughs> you know, as the old radio guy, I've done everything from country to it, it's classic rock now, but when I did radio, it was rock um, to talk radio and the like. My playlist personally is very, very varied. Uh, you know, I started off in high school in the early 80s, and of course, I'm listening to ACDC. Def Leppard and, uh, you know, Rush as well and through there. Went to college in the mid-80s and started working college radio, and then I discovered alternative music, R.E.M., um, Killing Joke and the like, this post-punk movement and uh, the jangle pop, if you will, and a lot of these, uh, even bands like the Dead Milkman, kind of this fun punk stuff. So I vary greatly, and if you look through my collection, it, it's it's all over the map. And then more recently, I've never been a big fan of country music, but I'm starting to have a better affinity for bluegrass, uh, thanks in no part to Michigan's own Billy Strings, who's just a phenomenal, phenomenal bluegrass artist. Okay, we are at the end of the hour. Oh. And I hate to end up here. Uh, do you have time to hang around for a few more minutes after the news? Yeah, I do. Kim's, Kim's running the store. Well, and the reason I ask <laughs> is we don't have a focus guest. And there is a question that you and I talked about off the air that I had here. I just never had a chance to ask. I'm going to give you a chance to think about it. Give there a chance for listeners to think about this. Uh, the artists of today. Okay. And you think about the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, just two examples of artists from so many years ago but are still prominent and relevant today. They've got longevity that doesn't seem to ever end. Is there an artist today that is going to have that same longevity mm. that we're going to talk about from 50 years from now and say, yep, they're still relevant, they've survived, they've gone generational, and their music is now classic? Okay. Think about that. Okay. And that's the, we'll get an answer to that question. We appreciate it, Jim, and asking him to hang around. And listeners, you think about that, too. Uh, your favorite artist, would it be one of your favorite artists, or uh, would you think there would be an artist that you just can't see lasting all that long? I'm sure there are people back in the 60s that thought the Stones and the Beatles oh, yeah. wouldn't last as long. So that's what we'll do coming up. In the meantime, uh, RadioWastelandRecords.com. I'll use that as just as a reference to find out more about what's happening online and more of the connections. Jim Gleason is our guest. We've got a break for the news. And we'll come back with you on WSGW. Uh, Charlie in for Art Lewis this morning. We'll get into the uh, Focus Show and kind of continue this a little bit. Terry Henney's Farm Show is coming up at 1130, as Terry be along for his final farm show, of course, of 2022. But the news is next on WSGW. It's 11 o'clock. It's time to focus as WSGW presents the people, the places, the businesses, the culture, the area events and activities, all put into focus on 100.5 and 790 News Radio WSGW and online WSGW.com. Focus is presented by RoofMax. That's RoofMax with two X's. Well, the focus show now. Art Lewis, generally your host, but again, Art's off. He returns on Monday. Charlie Rude continuing this morning, and we are going to continue a conversation we were having last hour. We appreciate his time and holding over. Uh, Jim Gleason, who has been engaged in a fascinating conversation from some of the uh, messages we're receiving from people uh, from his business of Radio Wasteland Records in Midland. I asked Jim to hang on if he could. We didn't have a focus guest scheduled, but, you know, we talk about what focus is all about. We use the word, the business is the culture. Mm -hmm. Boy, if music doesn't fit culture. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> oh, man. So before the news, this is a question, of folks, when Jim and I were connecting to make this radio appearance possible, there was a question I had for Jim, and I'm going to pose it now because we need an answer. Is there an answer <laughs> of the music, the artist, the group today that exists that 50 years from now 
we'll be talking about in the same way that 50 years ago when the Beatles and Rolling Stones, getting close to 60 years now, yeah. that are still relevant, still prominent, and still, uh, for as many groups and artists that have come and gone and forgotten, there are some that just carry on. There are. And one of the cool things about music is the fact that uh, it can be tremendously subjective. What I like, not other people, they might not like. What uh, other people like may not necessarily be mine. But there are, as you mentioned, some groups out there that can transcend that and they leave kind of an indelible mark on culture, on music itself, uh, just a great deal. Um, you mentioned the Beatles and the Stones, and we'll, we'll say the Stones are included in this, but probably more so than the Beatles, or more more so the Beatles. They are the ones that were at the forefront of the British invasion. They are the ones that took rock and roll music, essentially international, brought it to the U.S. Now, I'm not going to, we, we talked about Elvis also, and I don't want to downplay Elvis's impact and everything, because culturally speaking, that was also a big, big deal, musically speaking as well. But where Elvis uh, would not have gotten to where he was without soul singers and Delta Blues, from the 40s and 50s to get him to where he was. Um, the Beatles would not have been able to go where they did if it weren't for Elvis breaking a lot of these cultural uh, boundaries about what rock and roll music could be to the masses. You know, get away from this Mitch Miller and the, the big band stuff and start shaking your hips, Elvis, because this is going to change the world. And then the Beatles changed it again, but building upon that. So the question, uh, Charlie, was, you know, is there somebody today? And... That's a toughie. I mean, there's a lot of good music out today, and there's a lot of not-so-good music out today. But again, subjectively, that's my opinion. If we were to look at a specific artist, and let's say, let's say, let's go back to the Beatles and say, break their uh, impact up to both be cultural, um, musical influence-wise, uh, and financial. I think they hit all three of those points very successfully. They changed the culture of music. They influenced countless numbers of bands in the decades that followed them, and they were tremendously financially successful. I mean, to the day where Sir Paul McCartney can still put out stuff and sell millions of records with that. Um, I don't know as if that type of lightning in a bottle could ever be recreated again, all three of those in one. But you could make arguments that any number of artists could make that success financially. Let's go to Taylor Swift as well. I would suggest that uh, she could be both culturally important within 50 years and the impact that she had in the music industry financially will be felt as well. Musically, on the influence side, maybe it's just me, but I don't see that as being something that will hold up. Now, if we're looking at strictly from the music, say, okay, it doesn't matter how old you are, you could probably hum at least one or two Beatles tunes. Will that be the case? I don't think so with any of the artists today. That's just me again, though. No, that's that's and that's fine because you're right, it is. And yeah. at some point, that question will be answered. It's just that we might not be around to we know the answer. No. no. The one thing, though, and I can touch back on Taylor Swift, we talked earlier in the previous hour about uh, the vinyl industry having trouble keeping up. And the demand is there specifically. Let's talk about Taylor for just a moment here. The impact that she has had financially on the recording industry in, in, in general is no secret, but to the vinyl industry as well. She has embraced her music on vinyl, so much so that she was named as the Record Store Day ambassador, the first ever international ambassador. I mentioned Record Store Day as well as an event. They would always have an ambassador, uh, a goodwill ambassador, to be the face of that particular year's Record Store Day event. She was this year's Record Store Day ambassador, and that kind of uh, that that shook a lot of independent record stores because she's not typically what you would think of as far as an independent artist because she's so commercially successful uh, and has embraced the big box stores as well, getting their vinyl out. But she, more than anything, has done a lot to promote the vinyl resurgence. Again, air quotes on that. But at the same time, hinder the vinyl resurgence. And by that, I mean that uh, the demand for her records was so great that it actually put a bit of a delay dent in the pressing of other people's vinyl. Uh, you you had difficulty because of her new one, Midnight's, for example. She not only released that digitally in compact disc, but there were at least four different vinyl variations of that. So you've got four times the pressing taking place for one record. She did four different color variations with four different covers, and 
Oddly enough, if you bought all four of those, you could buy a clock assembly from her website, and the back of those covers formed the face of a clock of Taylor Swift albums that you could use. <laughs> so, I mean, that you're talking marketing brilliance at this point on there, but it's also something that is taking advantage of a tremendous interest in vinyl records at this point in time, but at the cost of saying, okay, you've got a, a group like Wet Leg, which is a great upcoming group, Grammy-nominated, uh, that puts out some great music, but they're going to have trouble. All of these other newer, younger groups are going to be put on kind of a back burner to get their vinyl pressed well, because Taylor Swift needs another gajillion more of them out there. And all of what you just referenced regarding Taylor Swift would never have been talked about a reference when it came to going back to the Beatles. No. You recorded music, you put yeah. out records, and that was it. You, did you, it. Put, you the And you got the radio airplay. That was it. Yep. Basically. And based on the radio airplay, you went back out and bought the records. records. <laughs> so it was a great, a great symbiotic relationship between radio and uh, the vinyl industry throughout the years as well. So we appreciate Jim Gleason holding over as a guest this morning. We've got a few more minutes left. We've got a few more quick questions to pose his way, and we'll do that coming up next on Focus. A couple of minutes left on Focus. We've extended the 10 o'clock hour with Jim Gleason of Radio Wasteland Records into the Focus program. We've got a couple of more minutes left with Jim, and again, we appreciate your extra time. Uh, you really had to twist my arm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> to sit behind a microphone and talk music was a difficult thing for you this morning. Uh, I should ask, and this is kind of funny, this goes back to uh, Art's not here, but uh, since it's this program, I'll pose a question that Art kind of, <laughs> kind of laughingly had uh, wondered when it came to the name yes. of... Your store, Radio Wasteland Records, seems to be an odd name. It is, but uh, it's kind of a two-prong approach answer on this one. Radio Wasteland was the name of a radio show that I had done in the mid, uh, as I around 2014, 2015, on public radio, uh, where I played punk and alternative music on public radio. I can't understand why that was not a bigger thing, but <laughs> so, um, but the name at the time I had chosen. Um, as kind of a statement against corporate radio, and I got to be careful talking here on there too. It's just uh, from the '90s and the Clinton FCC deregulation. Um, I think that that had a big effect on what local radio is. You guys do a great job here with that, but the corporate ownership overall kind of stung me a little bit uh, from a uh, in this industry that I loved. So when I started doing a radio show, it was a, kind of a, a volunteer thing on the public radio. I was thinking around a name, and I took the uh, the line you mentioned the uh, Newton Minow speech where television was a vast wasteland he was an FCC commissioner back in the 60s and they held public hearings and just were trying to hold the television industry's uh, feet to the fire as it were to create quality programming so to speak and so I kind of co-opted that and I actually used the clip of the Minow speech in my open on the radio show combined with a Freddie Mercury song about uh, Radio Gaga radio and wasteland as my open so that is where that came from. Fast forward several years to when we were opening the record store in 2017. I thought, man, you know, this would be cool. I have a store, but, you know, what are we going to call it? And I thought, you know what? I've always liked the name Radio Wasteland. I used it for the radio show for a couple of years. Carry it forward to this, and it's worked for us. Now, the definition, if you will, um, you could read into that what you will. A lot of stuff comes in. I get, I'm a personal collector of uh, old promotional records from radio stations when i find them uh, they usually go into my personal collection i've got a uh the, the, the crowning jewel is a 1969 rolling stones radio station only promotional record uh, that's in my personal collection which is great but if you think about it uh radio and vinyl as we talked about have always had this great relationship with one another maybe we could say that uh what we've got now in these used records is kind of the after effect of what uh, radio used to be it works for me. Okay, <laughs> as long as it works for you, <laughs> I am reaching. You know, that's it's 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 kind of neat. But no, the name did come from this amalgamation yeah. of uh, the Newton Minow speech and and me having some fun with uh, corporate radio. Well, let's close by reminding folks <laughs> where we can find you physically, as much as we talked about online. Radio Wasteland Records dot com. The physical. Yep, we are at seven one six George Street. Uh, it's north of downtown Midland, uh, about a few blocks away from Dow Diamond. Um, but uh, kind of in the Midtown area. 
and uh, we're mostly known to be near the school bus parking lot <laughs> there as well. But uh, And visit you what, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Correct. Uh, closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, but I'm there most of the rest of the time. And, uh, you know, our hours and everything are posted up on social media and on our website as well. And you encourage people, if they have something of interest, to bring it into you. Bring it in. Uh, when it comes to vinyl and collectability, I'm always one to help folks out with this. I would rather... I would rather see us take a look at some vinyl than have it end up in a uh, in a landfill somewhere because you never know. Nine times out of ten, most records aren't going to be worth anything, but there's always that chance that there's something something buried in a collection somewhere that's worthwhile. And uh, you know, we work with folks on that to try to be very very fair when pe- people bring stuff in. I should ask. Uh, we, we talk about we talking strictly albums. Are people bringing in old forty fives? Oh, Are you seeing the old seventy eights? I do see seventy eights and forty fives. The old shellac seventy eights. Uh, there's no market for what's. It's sad, but there's no market for. I've got an old Victrola in the store as well, which is kind of non-working at the moment. I got to fix that up, so I can actually play some seventy eights from time to time. But there's zero market for those. I have just a handful. I got rid of a whole bunch about a year or so ago. Same thing with 45s. You get some people who are tremendously, and I'm talking tremendously passionate about 45s, that uh, that's what they collect or they want to fill up a jukebox that they've restored or something like that. We have a limited number of 45s, but not that many. Again, I try to clear those out at uh, you know pennies on the dollar when we have the chance to because they take up so much space. But we do deal specifically with, uh, mostly rather, with uh, 12-inch LPs. And uh, we have everything from... A dollar room with thousands and thousands of things like Mitch Miller and <laughs> and the like, to high end collectibles that, uh, that range in the triple digits and really everything in between. Well, as Jim mentioned, there are fine record stores in Saginaw, in Bay City, and his store in Midland, Radio Wasteland Records. Jim, Jim, again, thanks for your time today. Thank you so much, Charlie, for inviting me. This has been a blast. It's been a great conversation, I think, and I'm sure our listeners think too. We'll close out focus coming up in a moment on WSGW.